I hope the uh, sound is on. I think so. Um, thank you for being here and starting with this short course in the core problem in international affairs, and that is how to reduce the inclination, the very bad inclination in the world political system uh, to seek settlement of conflict with violent means, war. Now that's something you will be worried about when you, on a daily basis, see the violence in the world system. Um, you can, I think, measure the degree of civilization of a political system according to the degree to which the violence problem has been solved. That is task number one of every government, to make sure there are institutions, effective institutions and procedures for peaceful conflict resolution. There is no society without conflicts. Human beings have different interests and have different views, different beliefs, different religions, different ideologies. There are always conflicts. So the grandmotherly society of everybody happy and in peace and no conflicts whatsoever does not exist. The question is, will conflicts, which are always there, be solved with peaceful means? like we are used to in well-integrated, developed countries. In the Netherlands, if you have a conflict, it is not necessary to shoot your opponent. And that same uh, uh, system of peaceful conflict resolution works in almost all of Europe, not entirely. It works in North America. A part of the world has managed to settle this age-old dilemma how you get into peaceful conflict resolution um, and build up a peaceful society. The number one task of governments, as I said. Um, unfortunately, the world political system has not solved this problem because it's not an integrated system. We don't have a world government. We do have a world legal order, international law, international public law, but the problem is, who maintains it? Who keeps the participants in the world political system uh, in such a way in their behavior? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, it was not on the screen. Okay. Um, <coughs> that we do not resort to violence. Now, I've divided the subject of this course in a number of elements. Tonight, tonight I'd like to deal with recent wars, civil wars, and peace operations, and the main institutions which were created after the Second World War, which try to solve this urgent question, how to avoid violence in the world political system. Tonight is an overview. Next week, and in, on the 10th of March, in two weeks, we go to the causes of armed conflicts. If we want to fix the problem that I described, of course, we first of all have to as understand what causes this problem. What is the um, <coughs> set of reasons why human beings make war again and again throughout history? Most of history is determined by the wars that are fought and by violence. That's not a pleasant uh, remark when we all think of uh, the value of civilization and peaceful behavior, but it's uh, a crude fact that much of our history is determined by violence. Then two weeks later, we go into the question of humanitarian intervention which is the use of military power for, let's say, good ethical purposes. Not always, sometimes under the word humanitarian interventions. Uh, other purposes uh, play a big role. And the more recent doctrine of the responsibility to protect, which was um, adopted by the United Nations and which says basically, <coughs> although the member states of the United Nations are sovereign, and 
are the boss in their own country and the international community is based on international law which gives a government almost exclusive rights within its own country there is an international responsibility also of other countries to make sure that a government does not constantly violate the most basic human rights of its own population. The responsibility to protect, formulated by the United Nations after a number of peace operations had, had failed utterly because of much too weak peace operations. The problem with this interesting doctrine, responsibility to protect, which says if a government abuses its own power vis-a-vis -vis its own population, kills people in large numbers, drives them out, marginalizes people, then the rest of the world should not just sit and look at it and stand by idly. Uh, it should make that government behave to deal with its population in a more humane fashion. It's a very good doctrine, but the problem is in the application. I know of no intervention which really met the requirements of the responsibility to protect. The one coming closest to it was the intervention in Libya, but it turned very sour because the governments applying the doctrine forget that forgot that the doctrine has three elements. The responsibility to prevent large-scale mass atrocities and suppression. The responsibility to protect, which gives the international community the right to intervene if necessary. But also, the third, the responsibility to rebuild. After the invention in Libya, the United Nations and NATO went home. It was like a surgeon operating a patient, removing a cancerous growth, and leaving the patient on the operation table without a good program for rehabilitation. And no wonder that that patient is deadly ill several years later, as of today, as it is today. Then, on the 7th of April, I'd like to uh, deal with long-term trends in the world political and economic system which are worrisome and which may increase the inclination to seek violent solutions. You won't become very optimistic in this course, but if you want to improve the world, and that's what you probably want, otherwise you wouldn't be here, you would shrug your shoulders, you first of all have to make a clinical analysis of what is the pathology of political violence. What causes this disease of mankind to use violent means? Pathology. So we are going to take a hard-nosed clinical look at what makes the world even more violent than we would wish it to be. And then at the end, we try to uh, conclude what is necessary to build a peaceful conflict resolution um, system in the world or in regions of the world, if it can't reach all of the world. We all know that wars and civil wars dominate history. We know that they are terribly destructive. We have now 60 million refugees and displaced persons in the world system, <coughs> more than ever before since 1945. So the trend is in the, wrong dis in the wrong direction. A couple of years ago, social scientists concluded that things were go going to get a lot better, that the inclination to go to violence was going down. And the statistics showed that there were fewer war, uh, uh, wars. I didn't trust those statistics because on the other end were long-term trends which showed that the inclination to go to war might increase. Now, this figure of 60 million refugees and internally displaced people, which is a term for people who do not cross frontiers but are fleeing for war and violence anyway, um, indicates the uh, pathology that we have in the world of violence. Not just <coughs> Syria 
a large numbers of refugees from northern Africa, from the Sahelian zone, from Eritrea, the Horn of Africa, from Afghanistan and other regions. As I said, we should try to be clinical in an academic fashion. We should reason not as someone from Ukraine or from Germany or from the Netherlands or the United States or from Russia, but, take the, but take, try to take an academic point of view. Let's say we are an, an observer from space landing on Earth and seeing that this is a very strange planet. It doesn't have a government. People are constantly fighting each other um, while they have the same needs. They have formulated basic human rights. Everyone needs medical care. Everyone has the right to a decent income, uh, the right to work if you are at wor uh, of working age, the right to um, have employment, the right to education, but it isn't implemented. There is no government which <coughs> takes care of this. And these people fight each other. These strange human <coughs> beings fight each other constantly. They have tremendous destructive power. They have tremendous brain power, but they also apply it for weapons of mass destruction. So let's imagine we are this being from Mars writing a report about the situation on Earth and making some suggestions what could solve this terrible disease uh, on Earth to go to war. I use the word war, but it's an old-fashioned notion. War, we think, is soldiers fighting each other. Actually, in modern war, it's much safer to be a soldier than to, uh, to be a civilian. In Africa, it is much more riskier to be a woman than to be a fighting soldier or a militia member. Increasingly, in wars, civilians are killed. The destructive power is directed at civilian populations. And the modern phase of war <coughs> is more horrible than some of the well-known historical wars. At the Battle of Waterloo, where all the major European powers fought each other, they agreed after heavy rain to cancel the fighting for a couple of days because it had become too dangerous for the horses. They might slip and break their legs. It's a strange thought in a war where you place your artillery on top of a hospital so that the people killed in the hospital will be blamed on the other side. Or where in some countries the modern phase of genocide is not anymore killing men at fighting age, it is raping women at a large scale to disrupt the entire society and destroy its future. So if you look at modern war, I call it contemporary armed conflict because it is war and civil war and criminal violence and economic violence all in one big mess. If you look at that, you wonder whether our assumption which we have from day to day that the human progress is really true. I will show you some statistics which are quite worrisome about the number of people who are killed due to political violence. Those statistics were built uh, by um, uh, a political scientist uh, who um, devoted much of his life to it. And uh, we'll come to that the next time. One of the conclusions is war is not the main problem. Most people are killed by their own governments in peacetime, by persecution. Prosecutions have killed more than the First and Second World War. It, to some extent, your image of what is wrong with the world will change because of this course. But it is necessary to look reality uh, into the face and see well, that some of our observations, day-to-day -day assumptions, are not entirely correct. That is the clinical approach. Um, okay. 
some questions that will all of you uh, that will occupy all of you um, will we at last be able to turn this century in a more peaceful one than the 20th, 20th century when we had two major world wars first one killed 25 million people the second one 55 million people why do wars break out why do wars recur there are some countries which again and again fall into war. There's a worrying statistic. Out of 10 countries which went through war or civil war, six fall back into war within 10 years. Conclusion, peace building is inadequate. We do not fix the underlying lack of mechanisms for peaceful conflict resolution. A ceasefire is negative peace in the sense there is no shooting anymore. It's the beginning of positive peace, building a system where conflicts are settled in a peaceful fashion. But this six out of ten which we turn to war within ten years is of course very worrisome and shows that it is very inadequate what governments and international institutions um, are achieving. Would it ever be possible to achieve lasting peace? You have heard of one of the major works of the famous uh, philosopher Immanuel Kant, who wrote Zum Ewigen Frieden. He said, <coughs> yes, it would be possible if, and then follows a whole series of ifs, which start <coughs> to deviate quite a bit from actual reality in the world. Not that his reasoning was faulty, but uh, people don't behave like the way he advocated to behave. <coughs> what possibilities do peaceful states have to end wars among other countries? And what is the right to intervene? I talked already a little bit about um, the responsibility to, uh, to protect. Item number six on this list I dealt already with very <coughs> briefly why countries fall back into war. One of the countries which has been most plagued by war, you won't think immediately about it, is Colombia. It has the highest number of refugees divided by size of population internal refugees, internal and external. And it has had periods of five-party civil war, again and again and again. So there's something very wrong in the institutions and policies and attitudes of people. And then again, how can we strengthen the international system for peaceful conflict settlement? We have in The Hague the International Court of Justice that was built on the assumption that if people have conflicts they can seek a verdict by judges like you do as a citizen when you have a serious conflict with your neighbor and you abide by that verdict. Um, on this world court in The Hague we have the wisest international lawyers from many different cultures but nobody uses the world court. It gives sometimes advisory opinions. The United Nations asks for opinions. And it's very <coughs> rare that actually countries submit a conflict to the court, which would be the smartest way to do. It doesn't cost anything. You can avoid enormous war damages. If you have a frontier correction that you differ with, with your neighbor, differ about with your neighbor, <coughs> you can ask the judges for a ruling, and that settles it. Hardly anybody uses it. And if countries go to that court, they reserve the right to ignore the verdict. Of course, what countries should do is beforehand say, this is the problem. You judges give your wisest, most, most objective uh, solution, and we commit ourselves to applying that solution, to abiding by international law. <coughs> and international law is not all that different from national law. You have the right, like you have in national law, to defend yourself 
if necessary. Um, there is in principle the possibility for international police and other actions which are necessary for a complete legal system, <coughs> but we don't act accordingly. Now, after the Second World War, um, <coughs> countries were very much aware that such a bloodshed had to be prevented. It should not happen again. That was already clear in 1918, when after the First World War, countries agreed to establish uh, the League of uh, Nations. League of Nations had a task to avoid a new war. It didn't work. The system fell to pieces. And in 1945, when the League of Nations still existed formally, um, it was absorbed in the <coughs> new League of Nations, which was an improved version, but not enough. The United Nations, established in 1945 in uh, Los Angeles in the United States. Which countries established that? Not the 193 countries which uh, make up the world today. The countries uh, colored here, the black countries did not have a representation at that conference. Most of them, black, were colonies, <coughs> not independent, not represented there. And one of the big changes in the world is the enormous growth of the number of independent states uh, due to decolonization. It was perhaps between 50 and 60 countries that established the United Nations. And they agreed on the basic rules of international politics in the Charter of the United Nations, and that still <coughs> is our guidebook today, with its weaknesses. Major weakness also on the, this map. Permanent seats on the Security Council. Um, it was agreed that you cannot, with all states, deal with all problems. So there was a committee called the Security Council, uh, nowadays of 15 states. And the United States, which had designed the system with a number of European international lawyers, wanted, of course, very much the Soviet Union on board as a major player, as a potential superpower. But the Soviet leader Stalin only uh, wanted to join the United Nations if he would get a veto right meaning if I say no, it is no. Then you can stop the whole machinery if you have the veto right. <coughs> and so this concession had to be granted to the Soviet Union and then the United States itself also took a veto right and it granted also a veto right to the United Kingdom, France uh, and China. At that time, nationalist China before the <coughs> communist takeover in China. So five permanent members on the Security Council. Security Council has uh, uh, 15 members. Um, also, other members are uh, elected uh, every two years by the general, less undemocratic organ of the United Nations, the General Assembly. And in order to get a decision to maintain peace, you need a majority of nine out of those 15 votes and then comes the major weakness, no veto. So any of the five veto-holding states indicated here with that United Nations signal can stop the whole machinery. And that is the short answer to your question, why does nobody stop the violence in Syria? Russian Federation doesn't want an intervention, is supported by China, they say no, so it is no. And the United Nations <laughs> cannot do anything that is crucial in stopping that war. And that also explains the veto, why the United Nations um, became almost completely powerless in the, second, in, the, in, the cold, <coughs> in the Cold War. There was a Turkish minister in 1945 at this conference in, um, in Los Angeles who understood the consequences of, this, of the system. And he said, this is going to be an, a funny organization. Always something will disappear. If there is a small war between two small countries, the war will disappear. That we can handle. 
if there is a war between a small country and a big country, the small country will disappear. And if there is a war between two big countries, the United Nations will disappear. And that's the shortest possible summary of the effectiveness of the United Nations. Still, it is the only world political organization, uh, including everybody, which we have. So we have to do with it, and we have to try to improve it. There have been many proposals to reform the Security Council. We'll talk more about it later on in this brief course. This is what the world looks like nowadays, not with those black places of unrepresented people. We now have 193 members. Russia is a bit smaller than uh, at the time of this 1945 map, uh, when it was the Soviet Union. Um, it is a colorful world. Everybody has uh, a vote in the General Assembly, which is based on this old fiction of state equality. Whether you are China with 1.3 billion people or uh, Nauru with 65,000, you have one vote in the General <coughs> Assembly. So that doesn't reflect real power relations and responsibility. It's a bit more reflected in the Security <coughs> Council but the Security Council suffers from the veto. Ideally, when we would design a United Nations system today, a world peace system, we would give countries weighted voting according to their contribution, their size in economic and population. Don't think United Nations is world democracy. It is not an association of people. It is an association of states represented by governments, and whether the government represents the interests and views of the people differs from state to state. Take into account that about two-thirds of the member states are no democracy. Take also into account that there are quite a number of states which are basically run, I'll put it a little bit harshly, by criminal organizations those who exploit the country and its resources and its population for their own purposes. Colonialism did not end with the decolonization. It took a different form. It became often internal colonialism. Now, this is the world map, as nice as it looks um, of today. <laughs> And then we turn again to the purposes of the United Nations to maintain international peace and security. That's the main task. In other articles, it also says to encourage socioeconomic development and to encourage human rights. But maintaining international peace and security is task number one. This is from the beginning of the charter. Let's focus ag again on this committee, the Security Council, whose task it is to make sure this is done. The 15 members, they are mentioned there. And they are also mentioned, it is also mentioned here that the other 10 members have to rotate throughout the world, different continents. It's not only regional representation, but when countries are voted for a two-year membership <coughs> in the uh, Security Council, also religion and culture are taken into account. So that most basic <coughs> trends in the world are represented. The Netherlands has been a member of the Security Council a couple of times and is now warming up for another effort to become elected to the Security Council. Of course, it doesn't make you a big power all of a sudden, but it can give you some influence on the agenda. And sometimes then a diplomat from your country chairs the Security Council. That gives interesting possibilities. When a Dutch diplomat chaired the Security Council at the time of um, a very bloody war in East Timor, in the Indonesian archipelago, <coughs> that diplomat 
wrote by himself a very clever draft resolution which gave the UN United Nations the power to intervene <coughs> and build East Timor up after two um, peace interventions led by Australia. So there are possibilities for small countries. World politics is not just a play of power politics, it is also an ongoing conference. And the degree of influence you have doesn't just depend on your muscles, it also depends on your ideas and your understanding of this conference. It goes on every day, 24 hours a day. And your choice as a participant, if you are a not so important participant, to which committees do you go, what do you say, do you listen well to what bigger players say, do you formulate ideas that appeal to their view, and to their view of enlightened self-interest, then sometimes as a smaller member you can help as a real estate broker between two parties to come to an agreement. And also, as a small power, you sometimes have the possibility to simply say no and block things which you think are unwise. I once talked to a famous Dutch ambassador to NATO who was known for his strength and the duration of his period. He was in retirement and I asked, can you tell me what did you achieve? And he said, really? Nothing. But when I stand for the gate of heaven and I get that question, I say, unfortunately not much, but I stopped many wrong proposals. And that was his justification. And that is not unimportant. <laughs> Article 23 says how this Security Council is uh, composed. I dealt already with that, so we can skip it. And then we come to the core of the problem, the veto. Now the Charter says we need the concurring votes of the permanent members, those five. In practice, the United Nations has been a bit more flexible and accepted that if one of the veto-holding states does not say no and also not yes, we don't count that vote. So there are a number of examples in the UN history where the UN was able to do something against the will of Russia and China when they for one reason or another, did not cast their veto. First example is already quite early in the history of the United Nations. North Korea, communist North Korea, all of a sudden invaded South Korea, which was more looking to the West, but still a very poor and weak country. United Nations Security Council met immediately in New York. The Russian ambassador, the Soviet ambassador, was absent. Why? Because his government leader, Stalin, had instructed him to boycott the meetings of the Security Council in general because of a difference of another nature. So the United, Na uh, United States introduced a resolution to come to the assistance of South Korea and start a peace operation, and the Soviet ambassador wasn't there to cast his veto. And that legalized an intervention, which then, of course, led to a lot of opposition from the Soviet Union, who vetoed all concluding, all following um, uh, resolutions. But then the United States thought of <coughs> a smart move. Let's move the implementation of this original legalizing, legitimating decision to the General Assembly, and at that time the United States had still more or less a majority in the much smaller <coughs> General Assembly. So that's how the intervention to restore South Korea was continued. And three years later, and unfortunately three million dead later, South Korea was free again and started to develop in such a way that nowadays it's one it's a member of the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the club of, what is it, some 35 
highly developed, industrialized, and more or less democratic countries. There are other examples where the veto was not cast and where um, one country or another abstained from stopping. Uh, one of them was uh, the intervention, the first war against <laughs> Saddam Hussein in 1991, after he had invaded Kuwait. That was such a flagrant uh, violation of basic international uh, law, thou shalt not overrun thy neighbor, that um, Russia, uh, or at that time it was still formally the Soviet Union, decided not to veto that resolution. So that legitimized a military coalition of at the time 26 states to oust Iraq from Kuwait and restore the independence of Kuwait. <coughs> In the sixth chapter of the United Nations Charter, it says we should first of all look for peaceful settlement of conflicts. <coughs> chapter six. Now, chapter six was also the basis for a smart new development, which you do not find in the um, United Nations Charter, the introduction of international police called Blue Helmet Soldiers, who are lightly armed soldiers collected from different countries uh, in white vehicles and blue helmets um, on the basis of approval by the warring parties. So they cannot fight the warring parties. They are there like a glass window pane in between two fighting neighbors. They, both of them find it useful to leave the window pane intact. <coughs> Example, Cyprus. South, Greek Cypriot. North, Turkish Cypriot. When they became independent in the 1960s, it led immediately to a civil war. The United Nations intervened, stationed just some 1,400 blue helmets there. They are still there. And, and in some places in Cyprus, um, the dividing line runs through houses and is only two meters wide, but no new war. And avoiding war, if you can't make peace, is already quite an achievement. And perhaps one day it will come to the formation of some Cypriotic confederation where North and South live in peace together in one political system. You know, Southern Cyprus has joined the European Union. The European Union has made the silly mistake of expressing the hope that once that would have happened, Turkish Cyprus would also be able to join. But of course, the Greeks and the Cypriots, Greek Cypriots inside the European Union have tried to block that. And that's one of the rubbing stones between the European Union and Turkey, and one of the differences between NATO and the European Union, because Turkey is a member of NATO but not of the European Union. Peaceful means is the preferred settlement of disputes. But what if that doesn't happen? Then the United Nations has the possibility to conclude that a certain situation is a threat to the peace, international peace, breach of peace, or it is an act of aggression. And once the Security Council defines a problem like that, it can move to chapter number <coughs> seven, enforcement. Enforcement is a nice word for applying military power against a party which does not behave. Now, the United Nations and its diplomats will not, never talk about making war. They will talk about applying all necessary means. When Saddam Hussein had occupied Kuwait, the resolution read, if Kuwait, if uh, Iraq doesn't leave Kuwait, 
the member states are allowed to apply all necessary means. And that means soldiers. So then this coalition of 26 states was formed, led by the United States, France, and Great Britain to oust the Iraqi troops from Kuwait. The whole effort was led by an American general who did something very interesting. I point that out because we as civilians always have the inclination to see the use of military means as something surgical. You call the mi military when something has to be removed, like an operation. War is not making an operation. War is a combination of deceiving your enemy, catching him off guard, doing something very different <coughs> than he expects, and then hit hard, but with precision. Um, that's what he did. He invited the world press to come to the shores of uh, Saudi Arabia to perceive exercises of foreign troops landing on the shores of Saudi Arabia. So everybody was thinking, particularly Saddam Hussein, we'll have um, naval landing on the shores of Kuwait. The general who led the operation did exactly the opposite. He attacked from the air in the back. And after two weeks, the war was over. Um, war is a combination of surprise, deceit, and power. That also means that you cannot infer from the military position of countries how many tanks do they have, how many soldiers do they have, <coughs> how many missiles do they have. You cannot infer from that who is strongest in a confrontation. The weaker may be a better poker player, he may be faster, he may do something that you don't expect, and you can be very much surprised. And that has always been so in the history of war. Uh, and often when you have a lot of troops and a lot of firepower, you think you are safe. Not so. There's an interesting book, those who uh, uh, want to uh, dig into this deeper, written by uh, a Chinese general about 3,000 years ago, Sun Tzu, on the art of war. It's very worthwhile reading because it also is much about politics. And one of the things he says, and that's very wise, is a good general doesn't fight. He arranges the things in such a way and talks to people in such a way that the potential enemy concludes, I'm not going to put up a fight because I may lose it. It is politics, basically. A good general doesn't fight. He arranges the chessboard in such a way that he wins without bloodshed. Article 42 says that if the peaceful means, I put it now in my words, don't work, the members and the United Nations may take action, and that may include demonstrations. We are diplomats, so we start with a, a demonstration, a blockade, or any other operations by air, sea, or land forces of members of the United Nations. The United Nations has no soldiers, so it also has to collect them. The Secretary General of the United Nations has to go head in hand through the member states and say, who wants to join? It's a bit, the system is called collective security, and it is a bit like the Wild West in the United States in the mid 19th century. Uh, farmers, ranchers, cowboys, and the government in Washington, far away, has no power. Everybody is carrying guns, so the risk of violent confrontation is high. But you do have, as a cowboy, as a ranger, some self-interest in a basic legal order. Because when you're doing well as farmer, you have savings, you put it in the bank, and you don't want the bank to be robbed. 
so you appoint a sheriff. And the sheriff, only one man with a gun, can only do something if, if all these farmers join him in the hunt after the bank robber. <coughs> That's basically the United Nations system. United Nations Security Council takes a decision, then all the members should join in implementing that decision. If they don't do, it doesn't work. And that's the basic difference with national integrated government, where you have a police and a court system. If you violate constantly the rules of the Netherlands, the end is that you get a court ruling and you have to go to jail or pay a fine. And if you don't want to go to jail, you will be hunted down by the police. That's the conclusion of the legal system. And that's the big difference with the world political system. Now, the United Nations does have, in today's world, a number of operations to uh, end wars. I won't go through all of them now. Let me just mention a few. This time, these are just occurrence. There are tens of them in the course of the years. Um, there are advisory missions, police missions, observing missions. You see, for instance, um, here, Unmo Gip, that is um, a mission, a military mission of observing the frontiers of Kashmir, the bone of contention between India and Pakistan since the decolonization of British India. There is uh, Anfisip, I mentioned it already, in Cyprus. We have a new member in the United Nations, South Sudan. It's split off after elections from North Sudan. And it immediately fell into war and civil war after independence. Very weak, very poor country, a uh, mess in the government. The United Nations decided to send a military and civilian mission to help that country get out of this trouble. North of it, there is a mission to help solve a problem between Sudan and South Sudan, particularly about oil resources. You have, that's one of the oldest mission. <coughs> and so the United Nations Truth Supervision Organization, which policed the frontiers between Israel and, the, and Palestine and uh, Arab states. And uh, long ago when Israel uh, conquered the Golan Heights in Syria, uh, a part of the Golan Heights was taken away from both warring parties and put under international government, so to speak. United Nations organizations, some Austrian and other soldiers who police every day the dividing lines and keep this bone of contention out of both Syria and Israel. There is a mission in Haiti after serious violence in Haiti uh, due to a very suppressive criminal government. Uh, the leader there is uh, Brazil, uh, leads that mission, trying to build that awful place, very, very poor and badly governed. 200 years independent, it's 200 years of criminal government. Um, and it's not all that been successful because its economic base is extremely poor. Now, you know that the Netherlands participates in MINUSMA now in Mali. Uh, we have participated in very difficult and failing peace operations in Bosnia, which are now closed. And uh, we still have the mission in <coughs> Kosovo, where the United Nations is present to help Kosovo to build up its legal order. The current conflicts that you see in the, in the news are quite worrisome. You see on a daily basis Syria and Iraq. I have joined them here because they have a common problem, that is the Islamic State, the violent movement to establish um, a caliphate. Um, I won't go now in the background and reasons of all these conflicts, let, let's just take a look at the, the, the whole sphere of war and peace. You all have seen in the past several years the trouble between Ukraine and Russia. Russia claiming the 
Crimean area and supporting an uprising in eastern Ukraine. We have the old problem of Israel and Palestine. Israel was created by the United Nations, a resolution creating a homeland for the Jewish people and a homeland for the Palestinians, which was not implemented. You see how fast politics changes and also our perceptions. The Soviet Union voted for the creation of Israel and later on became one of the enemies. Um, many Western governments were very pro-Israel for decades and now feel that the Palestinians got too much the short end of the rope and that their rights are constantly uh, violated. Nowadays you also find a lot about the war inside Turkey between the Turkish governments and the Kurds. And uh, this has also extended itself to northern Syria, where there is a Kurdish zone. The Kurds managed in northern Syria to uh, stay away from the war in Syria as much as possible in the beginning years. The Kurds are divided over four different countries, Turkey, Syria, Iran, and Iraq basically because of colonial history, um, treaties which were not maintained. And um, they, of course, have different purposes than um, keeping the present states uh, in shape. Uh, they want their Kurdish states, although they all have their own political divisions too. The war in Turkey against the Kurds is complicating a solution for the war in Syria and Iraq. I won't say more about it right now. We may return to it. You all have read about the war in Yemen, where the Houthi tribe is fighting the government, and the government is supported by Saudi Arabia, which has, um, with a lot of military power, intervened. Um, many casualties, no solution yet. Libya, I mentioned already, a seemingly successful intervention to remove a suppressive regime, but the mess is even bigger now than it was before. Libya has two opposing groups, each with their own tribal roots. The United Nations has tried to bring the two groups together and form a unitary government. Whether that works, we will see. Now, it's one of the major places sending refugees from the Sahel zone and from uh, northern Africa in general uh, up north to uh, Europe. Uh, many young people, particularly young men, who take the risk of crossing the Mediterranean knowing that they may drown. Um, still ongoing, but much less in the news, is the war in Darfur and Chad. Um, a war which has to do with the ethnic composition of uh, both Sudan and Chad. One could, could also talk about the Lake Chad Basin. It also involves other countries. Struggle between agriculturalists and uh, nomads. Uh, declining water resources, tribal war, power struggle in general, policies of the government of Sudan to marginalize as much as possible these more black people, non-Islamic. Um, uh, the bill of the war in Darfur is terrible. We forget that it is even larger than the war in Syria, 350,000 dead and three to four million refugees. Um, but right now, Darfur is closed off from the international news, so we don't see it on the, on the front pages. South Sudan I talked about. Burundi you may have read about. Uh, there were, uh, in uh, the 1990s, um, 
was a genocidal campaign in Rwanda, a neighboring country that also um, had its effects on <coughs> Burundi, Tutsis versus Hutus. Uh, in a period of just six months, 800,000 people were slaughtered in a genocidal campaign uh, against the Tutsis. Um, that underlying tension between these two major uh, population groups is still there and it is now as it did at that time, infecting politics in Burundi. Whether it will flare up more, we don't know. You could say it's a small country, so it doesn't take many political and military means to suppress new violence there. But it's also a country in which other and bigger powers are not very much interested. It doesn't relate to their own national interest. So nobody does anything. Afghanistan, you have had uh, a lot of news about several years, so I won't dwell about that. The still not solved, still not in peace. A new democratically elected president who tries to manage um, whether he will succeed, time will learn. The United States intended to pull out of Afghanistan. It still has some 9,000 troops there because it knows that if it completely pulls out, uh, the new president uh, will not survive more than a few hours. New threat of war in the South China Sea. China is rising as a world power. It looks like a very commercial power and it talks about we stay away from politics, we do business in the world, we are a peaceful, rising, emerging state. But in the meantime, China is increasing its military power tremendously. It's building a very vast navy, very, very big navy, fast. And it is creating artificial islands in the South Chinese Sea. If you have an island as a government, you also have rights over the continental shelf and a zone for economic explo exploitation. So the sea is very interesting if there is oil under it and other minerals. And if you uh, want them, one of the options is illegally <coughs> create an island, plant your flag there saying this is ours and it has been ours for ages and uh, you have a large uh, territory for future exploitation. Now, neighboring countries, of course, don't particularly like this. It gets China into terrible trouble with second rank powers, of which China is not at all afraid. Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia. Uh, and they, of course, turn to the United States and ask the United States to be the counterbalance and uh, sent its ships to these seas to show to China we are free to patrol these seas. These are international waters. Th these are not Chinese waters. And the Chinese government says, look, we are very peaceful. We are just doing business. We only have fishing vessels here. That they place guns on the fishing vessels is not mentioned. As far as equipment is concerned, one should call them uh, navy vessels. Then we have the frozen conflict between India and Pakistan. I mentioned it already, uh, Kashmir. Very difficult <laughs> to solve. We, as we are sitting here, could solve it in five minutes by saying let the Kashmiri people create an independent state. It's a big state. It has a majority of Muslim population next to Pakistan. Um, it's impossible for India to consider that option. Um, and uh, what is it now? Now we are a little bit too far. Too far. Uh, it's still on the low burner of world politics <coughs> and it complicates the situation in South Asia very much. If we go back to the problem of forming a better security council, we would all <coughs> agree that a big country like India, 1.2 billion people, has more right to serve on the security council than France, 
60 million people. But it's impossible to get India as a permanent member on the Security Council because Pakistan says no. And the same applies to other situations of rivalry in the world. So it spoils the possibilities to solve other questions. The problem of North Korea I dealt already with. You all have read in the last several weeks about North Korea's nuclear um, program. It most likely um, exploded uh, a large nuclear device with a missile, which of course makes Japan and others uh, angry. The missile has quite a long range and the United Nations Security Council is now discussing uh, sanctions against North Korea, which suffers already under an enormous package of sanctions. <coughs> so what else can the world do to make the North Korean government uh, change its behavior? Central America nowadays looks quite quiet after uh, a number of revolutions and wars there in the 1970s and 80s none of the underlying problems has been solved. This peace for most countries is a lapse between <coughs> the next war. In a country like Guatemala, which is owned by a few large landowners and run by a suppressive government, poverty and violence is as bad as it ever was. But it's not in the news. <coughs> and Africa, that's why I have this map. Here you see the ethnic map made by an anthropologist <coughs> in 1959 of the different peoples in Africa. <coughs> and you also see in black lines the division of Africa in states. Now these are not nation states. If you see how homogeneous they are, you see that most of the people feel no strong solidarity to this Western construction state. They identify with their tribe, perhaps with their neighbors, perhaps with other areas and relatives elsewhere, but not with this state. Much of these states, many of these states, were created at a conference in Berlin with a ruler <coughs> on the map where um, the colonial powers at the time said, this is your sphere of influence, that is my sphere of influence. Now, these colonies were, of course, since then decolonized, but it, the, the decolonization, which is generally seen as a good thing, by itself went very wrong because it created states which do not fit the feelings of solidarity of the population. You see how these dividing lines cut across tribal divisions, and I add to this that Africa will be the area of tremendous population growth in the next decades. <coughs> Africa at the end of this century will have seven times as many people as the European Union. Uh, the world map in your lifetime is going to change tremendously. And now, is th the problem is not so many people in Africa. The problem is so many young men with poor education, no employment, nothing to do, and the job most likely being offered to them goes hand in hand with the Kalashnikov and a uniform and being drafted into some militia, criminal or pol political. And that's an underlying problem which is often forgotten when people think about for instance, so-called Islamic violence in northern Nigeria or in the Sahel zone in Niger and other countries. The basic problem is not this ideology or religious orientation or not even the tribal orientation. The basic problem is nothing to do for young men. No work, very easily mobilized for political and criminal 
purposes. And these young men get, in addition to two or three hundred dollars a month and a Kalashnikov, and then all of a sudden a position in life uh, and a mission, they also get a story <coughs> delivered to them that tends to justify the crimes they would like to commit anyway. That is the explosive mix. And one of the worrying trends in our world is that the way our economy develops makes things worse. There is very little to do in the modern mob uh, globalized economy for people who have poor education, no work experience, no work discipline, are not connected to modern corporations, modern education, and so on and so forth, have no functioning labor market. What is there to do? that is constructive rather than destructive. And this question is, I think, also underlying much of the trouble in the Middle East and in Northern Africa, where more than half of the, popula of the young population is unemployed. Okay, yeah, very good, very good. Let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, again, I'm not making you happy with my remarks, but I hope at the end of this course you will be happy because then you hear what can be done about it. The scholars who made the map assumed that 60% of the domestic peacefulness is counted in this index and 40% of the external peacefulness. Now, if you make a different arbitrary decision and you say it's 50-50 and not 60-40 but 40-60, you get a different ranking. So take that into account. Up till now, they have applied that statistical reasoning consistently over a period of about seven years. So you can see the pattern in which it develops. I have argued with uh, the maker of the map that he should make two maps, one domestic piece, one external piece. That would be more informative to us as readers. And here are the factors. The internal factors <coughs> are perception of crime, security, homicide rate, you can read it by yourself, access to small arms, um, weapons imports, terrorism impact, and so on and so forth. One of the factors which drags down the position of the United States is, for instance, the very large number of people in prison. The United States has the highest prison population of all Western countries, divided by size of population. And that drags them down on this index. I'm not advocating leaving prisoners out in order to improve your index, but it has an impact on the statistics. And here we have external peace, military expenditure, now, when you're Costa Rica and you have no army, you rate well, of course. Um, if you pay a lot for United Nations peacekeeping funding, like Japan, it hardly participates with military, but it pays, you increase your rating. Uh, many refugees and IDPs, um, caused by your de de behavior, of course, um, many, many different factors. It's like much of statistics, it's a good scholarly effort to try to make things measurable, but take into account that particularly in politics, um, what can be measured is not always the most relevant. And what is the most relevant sometimes cannot be measured. So don't use statistics as a substitute for good qualitative judgment. <coughs> I think there was a, an expression by Albert Einstein on this subject which ran like this, what can be counted doesn't count and what counts cannot be counted. And that <laughs> is an even better way of putting it than I just did. Now, um, I talked in the first hour about the importance of the UN system, which is the institution responsible for maintaining the peace, but it's not up to its task. 
And that was reason for the United States and European states to feel unsafe after 1945 and create their own peace system. They included already in 1945 in the UN Charter Article 51, which says we have the right of individual or collective self-defense, which you as a citizen have too, particularly individual self-defense, if attacked with violent means, but only until the Security Council takes measures. Now, this is the basis of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, this Article 51, self-defense, because after the sphere of the Soviet domination of Central Europe after 1945 increased, also over Czechoslovakia, <coughs> uh, a number of West European countries got together and they said we cannot have this further expansion of uh, this uh, unbalanced political power in the East. We form our own alliance, 1948, Brussels Treaty. And a year later, the United States decided to leave its policy of isolationism and join this alliance and become the leader of the alliance. And that is the basis of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and that is why we hear a lot of talking about NATO. And this is NATO. The blue countries are the, ally the allies. Originally, it was limited to West, uh, Western Europe and North America. Um, after the downfall of the Soviet system and their alliance, the Warsaw Pact, many former allies joined NATO. And that's why you see the Baltic states, here, now being part of NATO. Not this <coughs> little area, that is part of Russia, Kaliningrad getting increasingly interesting because President Putin is placing missiles there to make sure that he believes really this is his sphere of influence and not NATO area. And of course people in Poland are getting very worried about that. Um, the dividing line of NATO originally was just about here. Eastern Germany was outside and Switzerland and Austria of course and sometime later Greece joined and Spain joined. Norway, interestingly, is part of NATO, not of the European Union. Sweden is not part of NATO. And what I'd like you to notice is the difference between the NATO map and the European Union map, which I show in a minute. Uh, there are some formerly neutral countries in Europe, which are really the friends of NATO, and they count on being defended by NATO if they get into trouble, but they're formally not members. Ireland, the, I the Irish neutrality is basically an anti-British position. We do, not, we, we do not join in the adventures, the military adventures of the British Empire. Switzerland for traditional reasons. Switzerland even didn't want to become member of the United Nations in 1945 thinking that would be a breach of its neutrality. Austria was uh, neutral after the eastern part of Austria was kept occupied by the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union at a particular moment let go, and then Austria chose a neutral status. You have here the uh, former uh, Yugoslav Republic, with the exception of Slovenia, which is a NATO partner, Romania and Bulgaria are recent additions. Uh, Macedonia <coughs> is in the waiting room, wants to become member of NATO, but Greece says no, it first has to change its name because Greece says Macedonia is a province in Greece. We are the true grandsons of Alexander the Great and not the Macedonians here. So the Macedonians call themselves the former Yugoslav Republic of uh, Macedonia, fire Rome. I once was at a meeting where the minister of uh, fire Rome said, 
unfortunately, I cannot, there is no Phyrum language and I have to speak Macedonian. Turkey is a member from the beginning. And NATO tries to build up cooperation patterns uh, with the Istanbul cooperation countries. It's not so important from a strategic point of view. It has some partners which participate in NATO activities sometimes all the way here, Australia and New Zealand. Um, this is basically the organization of most Western countries which have <coughs> joined their security policy and have joined their uh, foreign policies. Some people said after the Cold War, NATO was established because of the threat of the Red Army from Russia. Russia has disappeared, uh, Soviet Union has disappeared over the horizon, fell to pieces, now we can do uh, away with NATO. Not so. NATO still exists and has found since that time a new task. It is the subcontractor of the United Nations for the heavy lifting in um, peace operations. When the United Nations had a number of peace operations in the 1990s, which it could not handle, it decided that the heavy work in which actually enforcement action is necessary had to be mandated to an alliance, a military alliance, and that is NATO. So it's one of its tasks is to be subcontractor of the United Nations. It ran, for instance, the UN-mandated peace operations in Afghanistan. Um, but the original task of NATO, defense of Europe, is getting uh, dusted off again because of the threat people feel here coming from Russia and after the war between Russia and Georgia. Georgia uh, wanted to become NATO member and that was reason to stir a lot of trouble in Georgia so Georgia could not <coughs> join and the same is happening in Ukraine. Here we have the European Union. Now NATO is based on a treaty which says we have to defend each other. If one of us is attacked, other countries join in to help. So if Estonia in the Baltic is attacked by Russia, the Netherlands government has to support Estonia. I cannot say this is far away, not our fight, it's too dangerous, we don't want to be in trouble with Putin. We are obliged <coughs> to assist the Estonians. European Union is not an alliance, formally, but in fact it is. I'll show you in a minute why. Here we have, of course, the membership. Um, you see Norway and Iceland are out and Turkey is out, and Switzerland is out. This is unclear. Some countries want to join the European Union. Some countries have joined not so long ago. This division line is also more or less the division line between being willing to accept large numbers of refugees or not. Um, Norway, Iceland, Switzerland um, are not members, but they follow most of the economic rules and regulations. They are in a way a silent member. They do what the EU wants, but they don't have the voting rights. That's the consequence of not being a member. Norway had a referendum on membership. The government had negotiated membership of the European Union and the population said no. What's going to happen here on the 23rd of June? I think it's a 50-50 chance that the uh, United Kingdom walks out of the European Union. And then they will most likely do what Norway has done and declare we follow the economics, we profit from the common market, but we are not participating in foreign affairs and other policies, policies we don't like um, so they will be 
non-paying but non-influencing members. Yes? That's a very interesting question because the Scots, who said no to the referendum of independence, want to stay in the European Union. So some commentators have said the following funny thing is going to happen. The British say no, then the Scots want a new referendum and they enter the European Union as an independent state. Looks quite complicated. We don't know what happens. It's, I think, uh, very unpredictable now. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the people, um, whether it's not a contradiction because it, it affects also the people in, in Scotland. They will have a vote in this referendum. And I think Scotland will, in majority, uh, vote for continuation of the membership. And if Britain as a whole says no, then the Scots have the short end of the rope and then they may want a new referendum on Scottish independence. Now, Finland is neutral because it was next to the Soviet Union. And if you are, in animal terms, a rabbit sleeping next to a big bear, you make sure you keep silent. That's what Finland did in the Cold War. And it focused very much on its own state building, its own economy. When the Cold War was over, Finland emerged as a very modern, strong, well-integrated society. Finlandization is what they call this. And now it is still neutral, but it participates with NATO in peacekeeping operations. Sweden is traditionally neutral. <coughs> Switzerland, Austria, I pointed out. Turkey is member of NATO, uh, but not of the European Union. And Ireland is still neutral. So the NATO treaty on defending each other in Europe does not apply to these cases, although they are members of the European Union. But in the Lisbon Treaty that we have on the European Union, there is an article which is often forgotten, Article 43, which says if a member state is subject to armed aggression, other members have an obligation of aid and assistance by all the means in their power. Again, somewhat vague, but it amounts to a similar obligation as NATO. So you could say, also because Article 51 is mentioned here, that the European Union is also nowadays a military alliance, one of their aspects. However, it has no army. It has no Minister of Defense. It has a coordinator, a high representative for foreign affairs. It has diplomacy, but it doesn't have the club nine, uh, the, the baseball bat next to the door to make sure that nice words can be followed by less nice deeds. It is perhaps a significant power being created but it goes very, very slow because of internal disagreements. The Americans are very frustrated about the lack of decisiveness of the European Union. And we as citizens read every day the arduous negotiations in Brussels to come to agreements on many subjects that doesn't look like a world power. That's basically due to the division. If you cut the United States into 28 pieces and give everyone uh, his own Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Defense, there is no American foreign policy anymore. And that's the problem with the European Union. There is no real political <coughs> president. Although Donald Tusk, the former Prime Minister of Poland, is president of the European Union, we don't elect him directly. And we do not think about a European government. So the feelings of solidarity are not yet with the European <coughs> Union as such, at least for many people. 
but one could base on this article a European joint defense policy. And interesting, the French president, Hollande, after the attacks in Paris, invoked this article, 43, saying you have to come to our assistance. We are under the threat of war by violent terrorists. And you have to do what we now discuss in Brussels. First time that this article was invoked. Now, there are more organizations in Europe having the task to mm, create peace. You don't read every day about the OSCE, or OVSA in Dutch. This is an organization which was basically created during the Cold War of mm, diplomatic negotiations mm, with the Soviet Union. It now has 57 members, and it talks about economics, it talks about politics and it talks about um, culture and exchange and democratization. It's a small organization. It is not <coughs> very decisive. It cannot take majority decisions. It can only take decisions if everybody minus one agrees. The country being put in the corner doesn't have to vote for its own resolution in which it is punished, but um, it is still useful because it's a very active form of negotiation and more importantly, it sends observers to all the trouble spots. You may have noticed when the war in Donetsk region uh, was going on in Ukraine that there were daily reports by OSCE observers who have the right to go through the war area and report what they see. And it's an important form source of information for the member governments on what is going on. And what makes Russia angry is that as the trouble spots are most <coughs> of them in or close to Russia, Russia says OSCE, which they first liked as a regional organization, <coughs> is anti-Russian because they all have these false stories about Georgia and Ukraine and a threat to the eastern state, while we Russians have a very peaceful government. Um, we have another uh, organization in Europe next to the EU and OSCE, and that's the Council of Europe. You sometimes read in the newspapers decisions of the European Council. Don't mix the two. European Council is the main organ of the European Union, and the Council of Europe is this area, in which also Russia is a member, which deals mainly with cultural and legal affairs. A useful institution. In order to be a member, you have to have had elections. You have to be formally a democracy. Now, that is not a very distinguishing criterion because there are also many fake democracies, illiberal democracies, where elections are engineered, manipulated by the government, and people do not really have a free and fair choice. And the only country which has been put on hold as a member is Bielorussia, with the Minsk government, which is still um, a state run in old Soviet style without communism. So they are not an actively participating member, and Russia is, even though the Russian government would not meet the uh, requirements of democratic uh, reasoning that many of you would like to apply. Sometimes countries are put on hold, uh, <laughs> their membership is put on hold uh, after, for instance, a military coup that happened to Greece, in the past, and that Greece returned, it happened to Turkey in the past. Useful institution, but without teeth. It cannot solve ongoing violent conflicts. Yes, indeed. Um, I have some more. Uh, let me be very brief. Thank you for reminding me. Russia has its own counterbalancing organizations the Commonwealth of Independent States, which is an effort to recreate the lost 
realm of the Soviet Union. After the war with Georgia, Georgia walked out of the Commonwealth. And the Baltic states don't want to be a member anymore. And um, then um, we have also organizations in Asia, the China, Shanghai Cooperation Council, mainly centered around China, but Russia cooperates there, mostly economic. It will develop also in the defense and security sphere. And we have the Eurasian Union, a creation of President Putin. Some countries do not really want to be in it, but they got an offer they couldn't refuse. <laughs> um, and then we have Northern Africa, where there is a lot of trouble. Um, next time I'll pick up the thread of uh, tonight. I didn't get through all the uh, sheets I have, <coughs> but we are not in a hurry because we have five evenings. So I'm sorry there wasn't all that much time for discussion, but we'll create extra time for discussion next time. Thank you very much for your attention.